we got Nick Crowley, man. Um, yeah, I say he goaded, man. I think I, I I seen somebody else react to him. I thought I did, but obviously I did it. But yeah, man, let's go ahead and get into the video, man. Hopefully y'all have a good Thursday. The video kind of pretty long, so let's go ahead and get into it. Joy Junction. Joy Junction was both the name of the show and the name of the fictional town in which it was focused. A town where numerous characters converged to tell stories, play games, and answer questions, all of which pertaining to Christianity. Each episode followed the same basic structure. They were 30 minutes long and would tackle one general lesson taught in the Bible and tell it through an acted out story. This was then interspersed with various games and audience participation as the show heavily leaned on including its young fan base and immersing them in the world of Joy Junction. They even had a live studio audience for every episode, comprised of kids ages 3 to 13, with the participants and crowd genuinely seeming excited to be there, which was largely due to its lovable cast of characters. The most prevalent of these was Sheriff Don, who was actually played by the creator of the show itself, Don McAllister. And all gang is here, so we're going to have a good time today, glad you could join us for the next 30 minutes. He guided the show from segment to segment, and often focused on the Bible while driving home the episode's central theme, while also being the one who most often interacted with the children who participated in the show. Then there was Forrest Hadley, a soft-spoken professor who, ironically, often had lessons taught to him due to his obvious clueless nature. Your problem, you'll even help when you did wrong. Uh, well, I'm not a poet, but how about, how about it'll even help when you're in trouble? Hey, Sheriff Don, you're going to And of course, the fan favorite, Whitler Dan, a caricature of a southern farmer known as the goofy storyteller of the group. Oh, hi. But of all the characters to come from Joy Junction, there was one or two who were by far the most popular yet polarizing. Oh. Ron and Marty. Played by professional ventriloquist Ronald Williams, Ron and Marty were far and away the most memorable characters for those who watched the show, and for obvious reasons too. Many children watching at home found the duo and Marty specifically to be off-putting, even horrifying, with some claiming that the doll gave them nightmares and was just too creepy to look at, causing many to stop watching the show altogether. But despite this, others found the duo to be hilarious and entertaining, tuning in week after week just to see them perform. For the viewers, it was a love or hate relationship with Ron and Marty, but even so, it was impossible to dismiss their impact on the show. They appear in every single episode that we have available today, and they were often tasked with teaching the children some of the series' most important lessons. Lessons like not to cuss. Things like I'm hearing a lot of swear words. All the kids are using swear words these days. I think it look like, oh, what's First of all, why don't you try immediately pray and asking the Lord to take those bad words and thoughts out of your mind. Hey, that's a good idea. Practicing self-control. Self-control? Oh, I don't think my self-control works. It must be broken. No, well, no, Marty. I don't think anybody can practice self-control all by themselves, but if you'll just ask the Lord to help you, he will. Defeating bad thoughts. First, we'll talk good words and thoughts come out of our mouth. It's almost so boring. It's saying like it's a good show though. I ain't gonna care. It's saying like it's some it's some some boring type shit. Like we need more shows like this too though. Not to be to be yeah, trivial, which they be watching Coco Man and all type of shit now. I I don't know why I just did that, but they be watching Coco Man and all type of shit. Now. Look, guys. Uh, in that, my bad. Joy Junction is classified today mainly as lost media. No official copies of the show have ever been. Characters were the most vividly remembered part of the show, and this is important okay. as these memories are essentially all we've been left with. You are still covered with that darkness and with that sin, and we say he'll wash us as white as snow. That's referring to the sin that's within us. Joy Junction is classified today mainly as lost media. No official copies of the show have ever been published by its creators or the networks that owned it. It just kind of ended one day and was never talked about again by those involved with the project. And this lack of archiving structures past just the media though. itself. If you were to look online for information on the show today, you would find next to nothing. There's no Wikipedia page, no actors, producers, or directors mentioning it in their work history or on their resumes. Damn. There's no official website. There's essentially nothing. That's weird. Not even so much as an official date in which the show started and ended, despite the fact that the show apparently ran for 20 long years. 
We know for sure that the show aired on CTN in the 1980s, specifically in the Tampa Bay area, before it was later syndicated and broadcast across the country on channels such as TBN and Smile of a Child. But today, none of these networks mention the show have ever aired exist. in their lineups, and none of them have ever provided an explanation as to why the show was pulled from the air. The only reason we even know anything about it is thanks to old recordings and VHS tapes captured by those who once enjoyed the show. With a few dozen episodes and some short clips from the series having made their way to YouTube in recent years, essentially serving as the only surviving relics of Joy Junction. Because of this, the show is largely a mystery, and information is incredibly scarce and hard to come by. But after doing some digging, I was able to find some mentions of it in old newspapers printed nearly 45 years ago that did shed a bit of light on the context surrounding its creation. The first mention of Joy Junction came in 1978 within the... Oh, 78? I wouldn't even so thought about it. It was not even a television show yet. Instead, advertisements were placed in the... 1978? I wouldn't even thought about it. <laughs> no cap. For weekly for My mom probably remember this church year. ...in Largo, Texas, that mentioned including some sort of in-person act specifically for children. I'm on born in the 80s, though, so. It's unclear what this performance actually entails, but coincidentally, just one year later, the show Joy Junction would begin filming in Largo, Florida, with these original performances likely serving as the inspiration and the basis for the show itself. Following this trail of newspapers, I also found that the show was created by a company called WCLF, which began broadcasting back in October of 1979, with the founder of the company vaguely mentioning Joy Junction as an upcoming project. And sure enough, one week later, that same paper included a television guide that mentioned Joy Junction showing on TV for the very first time, giving us its likely premiere date of November 10th, 1979. Aside from this, I was able to confirm that the show did in fact play all across the United States and wasn't limited to just Florida, which might be why finding an exact date on when the show ended has proven as kind of weird possible. too, though. I ain't gonna lie. But the most common belief across the internet is that the show lasted until somewhere around 2004 putting its lifespan at a surprising 25 years, which makes it all the more unusual that there's hardly any mention of it online, and that there was seemingly no attempt to ever even archive it. It seemed as if the parties involved didn't just drop the show and forget about it. They completely washed their hands of it, and tried their best to bury it. There are even rumors circulating that CTN themselves had all their remaining copies set on fire and destroyed so that the show would forever be forgotten. And when you consider everything that happened, this isn't really all that surprising. But what is surprising is the extent of the unraveling, and the way in which it began, as it all started with a simple water bottle. Water bottle. It's unknown when exactly that the discovery was made, just that it was a terrible one. Police arrest a man under the suspicion of distributing CP, only to find numerous images depicting it on his hard drive, with the vast majority of the victims involved being impossible to identify, except for one. Within the background of one of the images lay a hidden clue, a water bottle displaying the name of a swim and scuba school in Johnson County, Kansas City. Oh. Police did a search of the area, asking for help identifying the victim, which led them to a young child who swiftly pointed out their abuser as being a man named Michael Arnett. Michael was immediately arrested after... I fuck with Nick Holloway. I ain't even, I ain't even seen none of these at ones, at twos. I'm just not seeing the at three. It's crazy. But... I, I, I like how he, you know, word stuff too, you know what I'm saying? Him, you know what I'm saying? W, W, W. We definitely might be reacting to him more often. Which the true extent of his crime would be uncovered on his I like how he learned this shit too. They contained countless photographs and videos depicting the same disturbing material, including a great deal that was produced by Michael himself. The contents of these images are genuinely some of the most appalling I've ever heard described. Though we'll get more into that later, because there is something more relevant to this video that they found on his device. It was a lengthy online chat history with a man named Ronald Brown. And Ron, you're not one to talk. You're always on the telephone, too. Well, uh, I guess you've got a point there, Marty. Ronald's life was centered oh, around three things. Ventriloquism, Christianity, and children. His primary job was working as a traveling puppeteer with a show called Puppets Plus, working school events, birthday parties, and at local malls. He also hosted a weekly puppet show for his local congregation that he billed as being specifically for children. And of course, he had his role on Joy Junction. Every aspect of his life brought him in close proximity to children. And as it turns out, there were several undisclosed incidents that raised serious red flags about this. 
The first incident occurred in 1998, at a time when Joy Junction was still believed to be in circulation across TV stations. Brown was driving home late one evening when a police officer pulled him over for speeding. The officer shined his light in the car as Ronald reached for his documents, only for his light to catch something unusual stuck between the seat cushions. It was underwear. Children's underwear. Despite the alarming nature of this, Ronald would end up convincing the officer that nothing strange was going on, claiming that the old pair of briefs merely belonged to his puppet, Marty, that night. Man, you don't put no motherfucking panic, no, no, no motherfucking drawers on no goddamn puppet. Nigga, checker didn't have him. Nigga, I had his whole checker on. Nigga, he ain't have him. Ronald was allowed to drive away without further questioning. What? Though things get stranger from here. Around the time of this encounter, Ronald had been living in a home conveniently located less than a block away from a popular playground. And upon moving into this home, neighbors began to complain of Ronald's relationship with young children in the area. Every Wednesday, kids from around the block would ride their scooters and their bikes over to his house for free pizza. The group would eventually emerge from the home, and Ronald would drive them in his van to a nearby church, where he would supposedly perform his ventriloquism. These weekly meetings were strange to say the least especially because they were allegedly fairly secretive, with some children even sneaking off to meet the man without telling their parents. There were even other allegations that Ronald himself had hid their bikes underneath his home, almost as if he was trying- I ain't gonna lie. Lock him up. I hope they locked him up. I, no way you finna have no type of meetings or greetings with my child and I'm not there, or uh, I do not know. For one, my child, me personally, I don't have children yet, but when I do, Buddy, you get a, a GPS tracker on you, and you don't even know it until you until you know how to you know until you know how to talk for real. My kid, oh, for what the mama talking about? Suspicion. I'm gonna put a GPS tracker on my phone. Concrete proof of this. My kid. It was rumored that when neighbors checked underneath his home, they reported not only finding these bikes but used sex toys as well, which were stashed there for unknown reasons. There were never any sort of allegations made against Ron, legal or otherwise, but the red flags here are glaring. Red flags that seemingly went ignored, as people bought into Ronald's act as a god-fearing, silly ventriloquist. Though in reality, the chats found on the computer of Michael Arnett shattered so this right there. in the most dramatic way imaginable. Though even so, these chats aren't what you would expect. No, somehow they are much, much worse. I have, uh... The reason I be skipping some of this shit too, though, because I don't want to be copyrighted. Like for now, oh, I will have it. Whoa! I'm sure telling you. I imagine his eyes would be just about to bug out. Wet with tears, so scared of pebbles. Probably in temporary trying to imagine his body being cut up in. What the fuck? Within conversations were numerous messages between cool. the two men, fantasizing about <clears throat> killing children, but eating them, but eating them as well. With most of the messages being far too vile to discuss or even show in this video. And this wasn't just fascination, it was obsession. Ronald had even found a child at his church that he frequently discussed wanting to eat, mentioning that he would be the perfect feast for Easter, describing what it would be like to end his life and to consume his body. And this went far past just talking, as Brown had taken photos of the child from afar and had actually been formulating a plan to kidnap him. He had even sent a photo of the child with black lines drawn over it to show the various spots in which Ronald wanted to butcher him. Hmm. This was all supported by his friend Michael too, who himself claimed to have eaten multiple children, with a man even sending a photo of a two-year-old girl that was seen inside of a pot, inside of an oven. And this wasn't the end of the shocking discoveries either, as things were made even worse upon investigators searching into Ronald's username, UE Line. In doing so, they discovered an account on a website called cutedeadguys.net, which was and is a forum for sharing images of the dead between those who fetishize corpses. And within his account, Ronald stated that he was one of these people too, admitting that he loved the sight of dead boys ever since he was a young man. And he wasn't lying either. Upon these revelations, Ronald's home was raided where police would find over 200 images containing CP, 
which didn't even include the hundreds of others showing tied up children, children being abused, and children that appeared to be dead. Along with this, police also found a blow-up sex doll in the home that was dressed in little boy's clothing, and inside one of his sock drawers was another hard drive with images of countless dead children, as well as a single flyer for a missing child in the area. He also had hundreds of images of a young boy named Andrew, who had attended Brown's church and youth group, with the boy having died of a brain tumor years before. Photos that showed the boy's slow physical decline, all the way until his memorial service. You know, Ron, you have to invite Jesus Christ to come into your heart and ask him to forgive you of your sin. Upon his arrest, Ronald Brown admitted to everything. He truly did want to eat the child he had been eyeing up at his church, along with many others over the years. Though after saying this, he claimed that he would never actually have carried through with it, and that Michael and him were merely role-playing. This is heavily debated to this day, as technically there isn't proof that any of these delusions spilled over to the real world. But that's only what we know of, and considering the large quantity of CP in his home, the self-admitted obsession with dead little boys, and the actual plans he had to kidnap and eat a child, it seemed clear that it was only a matter of time before he finally followed through with his desires. For Ronald, there was no defense, and because of this, the judge handed down a sentence of 20 years in 2014, which would end up becoming a life sentence, oh, as it appears he passed away sometime in 2020, well before his schedule. That's what his ass get. This discovery changed the entire context surrounding Joy Junction, the wholesome TV show beloved by children all across the country, I'm only I'm for one of its main stars to be outed as a predator of the most disturbing caliber. But there was one last discovery made by law enforcement in Ronald's case that makes the show that much more chilling. During the raid on Ronald's home, officers found a collection of journals that Ronald wrote in daily, where he obsessively discussed young boys that he had been coming into contact with, highlighting his desire to know what it was like to kill them, and to know how they taste. These journals, to my knowledge, have never been released to the public, but the thing I find most interesting about this is the date at which these journals started, 1978, oh, meaning that wow. this disturbing desire had been brewing inside of him for decades. And coincidentally, Joy Junction just so happened to start one year later, in 1979, meaning that many of the kids seen on this program were likely the very same ones that Ronald wanted to eat. Given this context, it's no wonder why all parties involved with Joy Junction cut ties with it completely. It just changes the entire feeling of the show. From the moment that one simple water bottle was identified, Joy Junction's fate was sealed, and so was Ronald Brown's. Still though, I'm left with many questions after reviewing this case. Was there anything more to that traffic stop in 1998? Or those pizza parties with the kids? And how serious was Ronald about following through with his plans to kill C? With the answer to these questions likely being taken to the grave along with him. But what I find so fascinating about this case I like is that the of the cold. Michael Arnett's home is still being felt to this very day. Honest devices weren't just chats from Ronald Brown. In fact, there were hundreds of other predators, with officers going on to arrest many of them, some of whom are still in the process of being tried and sentenced. Wow. And when reading into some of these other cases involving Michael, it's evident just how serious these people were about their dark cravings. One of these men was even recently caught having built an entire bunker, equipped with torture tools in preparation for his first victim, which he planned to share with Michael. On top of all the CP distribution, these fantasies about killing children weren't just roleplay. These were very real thoughts and very real plans. But the one small bright spot of this case is that the two-year-old girl that Michael had photographed in his oven, thankfully, was found alive and well, and he too never got to carry through with eating a child, at least that we know. But his physical abuse against them was in fact very real, and as were his desires, desires that him and Ronald likely would have acted on had this entire uh, ring never been exposed. They probably were doing that shit too on the show, I ain't gonna lie. When it was conceived, Joy Junction was meant to teach children morals, right from wrong. But ironically, many of these lessons just so happened to be taught by a man who was actively engaging in the very behaviors that were condemned by Joy Junction. Thanks. Uh, I was just. They were looking at some dirty pictures and they wanted me to look too. As your companions, you should have friends who have pure and clean thoughts and will only give you good ideas. With his actions forever tainting the show and condemning it to a lifetime of obscurity remembered only for the man and his puppet who brought the whole thing down. As a matter of fact, there's something I want to share right now. 
Really? That's right. Don't go away, kid. Joy Junction is coming right back. I'm gonna ask my mother if she know. It's more like on my well hair on my uncle hair one on should know. I ain't gonna lie. Um That being said, man, see when I see uh this was a weird I felt like he was doing that. He was, you know what I'm saying, you know, you know on the kids, you know what I'm saying, um it's crazy because you you want to know who who actually do it. Like that's that's the most sickening part about this. But people like that deserve what they have coming to them, and he got what he deserved. Um, that being said, man, um, Nick Crowley, I, I I like I like how you word your I like how you word your videos. I like how you you know at one, at two, at three, at ending. You feel me? I like that, and you use cold words too, and you explain the cold words too in the video. That's a W. So you know what I'm saying? He's certified. Now we're gonna start reacting to him too more. I'm gonna see how it go on the you know what I'm saying when I upload the side. Depending on how that go, we y'all will be seeing more reactions of Nick Calloway. I mean Crowley. That being said, see you when I see you. Let's ride. <laughs> What do you